and himself. He will be talking about remote working. So, welcome to the meeting. Hello, I'm David Artis, and it's very good to be here today. Now, about five years ago, when I used to work for another company, they had a bit of a problem. They wanted to take uh, an assortment of offices that they wanted, combine them all into one. But the problem was, the one office they wanted to move everyone into didn't have enough space for the number of people. So they decided to start hot desking. In other words, no one had their own desk and turned up and found any desk that was available to them. The problem with this was that even taking into account the number of people that was off each day, either on holiday or off ill, there still wasn't enough desks. So they decided to promote working from home. The problem with this is that the junior management didn't like it because they had no idea what their staff were up to when they were working from home. In the end, it was resolved by senior management making some sweeping redundancies. So actually, the issue went away and they decided not to do hot desk anymore. As soon as that happened, junior management cancelled working from home for everyone except for the only people they trusted, fellow managers. And I'm going to the next one. By mistake there, excuse me. We've got a second technical problem here, which is not resolving itself. Um, yeah, I'm just to say, I didn't. I didn't Right. Sort this in the video second. Apologies. Okay. Isn't doing what it's supposed to, so I pop is my side now. That's good. Thank you. Sorry. Right. <laughs> it just stopped scrolling on my notes. Can't read. Um, okay. So, there are quite a few talks at work camps about remote working. They'll tell you how great it is and you should all definitely do it. However, if you work in a traditional office-based environment, moving to it, whether just for some staff or for everyone, is not that simple. Now, we're going to explore the changes that any business will need to make for this to work, from hiring people to manage them, managing them day to day. We're going to learn how effective remote working can be compared to working in an office. And I'm going to show some simple techniques that you can use to improve both environments. Now I can move on to this. Remote working requires changes to how you manage people, and it can benefit everyone. By the end, I would hope that you understand what I mean by this. But don't take my word for this. Remote working requires a specific mindset and a completely different management structure and workflow. First of all, you need some background about myself. Now, I work for Automatic, which is a fully remote company. We have no offices. And I've been working for them for three years. Before that, I spent 30 years at the most traditional office-based company that you can imagine. It was all wooden cubicles and rules that nobody could ever remember why they were there in the first place. Here's a picture of what it was like in the 1990s. And not much has changed since. And during that time, I spent four years working for a well-known IT company. Now, when it comes to old-fashioned, traditional IT companies, what name comes to everybody's mind? That's right, and that was taken last week. So, going from that to automatic was an extreme change, but I do love it. Remote, remote working, though, really isn't for everyone. Other talks will tell you about some of the upsides and downsides, the, the loneliness of not being in an office environment versus the lack of having to commute every day. 
Now, illness, that's one thing that they often don't talk about. I have never been so well since I'm no longer crammed in a warm air-conditioned office with thousands of other people. But lots of large companies have tried it. IBM and Yahoo both did and abandoned it. In the case of IBM, they once had 40% of their workforce working away from the office. So why did they give up? First of all, we need to look at how... Oh, it's going to do this again, isn't it? First of all, we need to look at how, in a traditional office, managers track what their staff are doing. On a day-by-day -day basis, then, how do most know that, what their, that their staff are present and working? By seeing that they're at their desk, in front of their computers, doing something that looks vaguely like work. In other words, not watching YouTube videos. So, can you remember that used to be, I don't know if this still, are, still is, um, software and websites where if your manager was looking, you pressed a key and a spreadsheet would appear, so it looked like you were still doing something. They existed for a reason. I'm, I'm going to keep doing that for this entire thing, moving on to the wrong. Um, so, when remote working is introduced and someone is working from home, how do they know what they're doing? Well, they can't. And two things then tend to happen. People take advantage of this. Managers become paranoid. Maybe for good reason, maybe not. Now, both of these things would be eliminated if the manager actually knew what their staff were doing. So let's look at what happened at Bloomberg. Employees took advantage of the perk. One was unavailable for hours at a time. Another wouldn't communicate with co-workers all day. Ten months in, we scrapped the benefit and now require all employees to work in sight to come into the office every day. Now, I think it's interesting that they refer to it as a perk and a benefit, as if it's something just beneficial to the employees. And I think that mindset there tells you quite a bit. And yet, how productive are office workers? Does anyone know what the statistic is for how much time the average office worker in the US spends actually working during a typical eight-hour day? Hmm? Any other suggestions? It's just under three hours. Now, it could be worse. In the UK, it's half an hour less. And you can't actually read it there, can you, on that? It's two hours, 23 minutes, is what it's saying. And although I can't find the source now, for the part of the UK that I'm from, I'm sure I read it's about one and a half hours. Now, the rest of the time is spent having breaks, going to the toilet, getting coffee, chatting to colleagues about what was on television the previous night, etc. And yet, there's a perception that remote workers are the ones not doing anything. Now, whether you believe those figures or not, here is another statistic. Remote workers in a study were 13% more productive, took fewer days off, and were more likely to work their full shift every day. So, why can't these big organizations get it to work? They say that people were less productive, but I put it to them, it's because they don't know what they were doing. They may be genuinely less, less productive as a result, or they just don't know. They're trying to manage them as if they're still working in an office. There's also the fact that the immediate, the immediate communication you can get in an office, walking up to somebody and asking them a question, doesn't now apply. They may have gone to the toilet or gone to get a coffee. You ring or message them and they don't reply. It's suspicious. So there has to be a change in mindset too. So what's the solution here? Simply put, it's better tracking of what people are doing at a meaningful level. Does it matter if somebody seems to be watching something on Netflix or chatting about the beer-filled evening they've just had, if they actually deliver what they need to do? Measure output. I work in support, and that's an easy one to measure, kind of. The obvious one is how many customer tickets I get through. In fact, we also measure documentation changes, internal posts I make, and all sorts of communication. 
That's then measured monthly against any vacation time that I had. That also needs comparison against everyone else. So a natural rolling custom queries would be seen across everyone in the same time zone. There's also recognition that we're not robots and it's going to fluctuate. We'll have bad weeks and good weeks. Now this next bit, my manager wrote, so I've got to read it out correctly. So, during the day, I can move away from my desk, maybe have a plumber in to fix a leaky tap, or I could go and mow the lawn, or do my washing. I know there's a clear expectation for me to get work done. This translates into reviews twice a year, where my progress is correlated with expectations. The reviews are not unidimensional, and there's no number that tells the whole story. Instead, we look at the outcome of the background projects that I'm contributing to, as well as a wealth of data around my primary work, customer interactions. I work together with my lead on creating this review, which gives me an incentive to keep track of my own performance and achievements throughout the year. As a result of all this, if I was sitting at home not doing any work, it would be clear to my manager, without needing to go over the top with their monitoring, that work wasn't happening. As the author, Scott Birkin, says, shouldn't the quality of work be the primary measure of work performance? But this is a two-way process. As Scott again says, if you don't make your work visible, it's invisible. So there equally has to be some oversharing sometimes of your work and also of your conversations. Automation can help here to vocalize, audit, and track things you may be doing. And this isn't something that only works for somebody who's working from home. It can bring immediate benefits to anyone else. So even if you don't want to do remote working, moving to a similar solution will give you a better view of what those who report to you are doing. And in a split working environment, you can use the same methodology for everyone. But something else you have to consider is to make remote working flexible. When you're at home and there are things around that need you doing, the temptation is to do them. So why not build that in? Make the working day as flexible as possible, rather than putting up the artificial barriers that are so often prevalent in working situations. Now, I used to work with a developer who was incredibly talented and a real asset to the company. Um, however, he wasn't a morning person at all, and he used to wander into the office at 11 a.m. at the earliest. And he started getting into trouble with management. Because of rules, he was told he had to be in the office by 10 a.m. Now, there are some people where strict rules on hours work are important, but this wasn't the case here. It was a regimented, single rule that applied to everyone, not taking into account individuality. He soon left. Again, to, squat, to quote Scott Birkin, we faithfully follow practices we can't explain rationally. Why is it that work has to start at 9am and end at 5pm? We have little evidence these habits produce better work. They become so familiar we've forgotten their merely inventions. By introducing autonomy, along with the aforementioned track in work, people can be free to benefit from the freedom that remote working gives, whilst allowing them to work at times when they will be most productive. As a result, you gain the best from people. And another thing often forgotten about is to make sure that everybody is properly equipped. At IBM, you'd be expected to work from home with a small screen laptop and nothing else. Now, working from a laptop on your coffee table for short bursts of time is fine, but it's not a healthy longer term working environment. So consideration has to be given for a home office setup. An external monitor, keyboard and mouse, maybe even a desk and chair. And just how old is the equipment that you're using? Where I used to work, they replaced laptops every five years, although it was usually seven by the time they got around to it. Even knew they were pretty underpowered, so after five years, they were awful to use. And this company I worked for was a retailer, and I was on call, and at certain times of the year, I could be the only person that, was, that could be essentially keeping retail stores opening when they had technical problems. But it was not unusual, after opening my laptop up, for it to take about 20 minutes to be usable. 
that was just a result of how slow it was. Good quality equipment is important. At Automatic, your laptop is replaced every 18 months. And the most you generally have to wait for any other kind of equipment replacement, even a desk, is five years. And you get to select your laptop specifications so you can choose something suitable for your own requirements. And this remains relevant to people in an office or at home. Not that you should be expected to be working from home. Remote working doesn't mean home working. And you'll get a bigger variety of people interested in it if you provide flexibility to go wherever they want. Sitting alone at home isn't for everyone. More extroverted people, for example, will often shun this kind of working as they need the company of others. So what about provisions, provisions for people to use co-working spaces? Now, you're probably thinking that a co-working space is only applicable if you don't already have an office. You won't want to pay for them to be in an office when you already have one. But in fact, all of the benefits of remote working are not being in your company office. An ad hoc co-working space for those where working from home isn't going to work out all of the time is ideal. They still benefit from a much reduced commute, less distraction, and you don't need to have such a big office. So, yes, providing a working environment for everyone is critical, but not a one-size-fits-all solution. Except that people want to work in different ways. And remote working brings discipline in a number of ways, many of which can be beneficial to the company at large. Documentation is the prime example. For effective communication, you can't just lean over and ask somebody to sat next to you. And if you're working flexibly, the person you may want may not be around. So timely and accurate documentation is critical. Yet it should actually be in an office anyway. But it's often forgotten. How many times have you spent trying to solve a problem only to learn that somebody else had already done it some time before? How easy is it for new joiners to your company to learn the requirements of their job? The requirement of remote working ensures that documentation then becomes a priority. And for much the same reason, it becomes a lot harder to do a do this thing now mentality, as the chances are the people and resources you need won't be available. It's easy in an office just to saunter up, some, um, up to someone and distract them from what they're doing for something which you could have waited to have done. And if it's not apparent already, communication is critical. Or as we say in the automatic creed, I will communicate as much as possible because it's the oxygen of a distributed company. Put the tools and resources in place to allow good communication to occur. Don't rely on email and an old instant messaging client that came free with your office software. And you need different tools for different jobs too. When, in, when instant communication isn't always possible, you need ways to reach out to groups of people easily. In fact, it can drastically improve how you communicate by writing things down in long form and publishing them and giving people a chance to get back to you on their own schedule. You end up with much deeper, fairer, and generally better discussions. Poor communication is at the root of most disagreements, conflict, and poorly managed projects. When people understand each other, difficulties melt away. Now, the reference to oxygen in the automatic creed is not accidental. Too much oxygen can be fatal as well. It's important to invest time making sure the right information isn't just published, but it's heard and understood by those who need to. This again comes back to having the right tools for the right job. Anyway, enough of this talk about communicating remotely all the time. If remote working is going to work, you need to sometimes be social. In person meetups are still important. In the VIP team, we have a yearly company retreat, and there's about 100 of us. And we also have one or two team meetings every year as well. As well as discussing work topics, we also do things like playing board games, karaoke, or going on a city tour together. These help us learn more about each other and our families. It's knowledge we wouldn't have gained in a normal week. We eat together, work together, and have fun together too. 
So consideration has to be given to this aspect as well. Even in a mixed working environment, you need to get your staff all together throughout the year and not in a way that's all meetings and business. Because that social interaction is something that you need to put back. Obviously, cost is a big consideration for doing something like this. Keep in mind, though, that a typical remote team saves money by not having to pay for an office, or paying for a much smaller one if you're in a if you're in a if you're a partially remote team. Invest the money you save on office-related expenses into these meetups because of the invaluable team building these experiences provide. It's not cheap, but what's more expensive is having a remote team that doesn't work well together. And finally, you need to consider specific hiring for remote workers. Now, here's a question for everyone. Who's ever been hired where they had a probationary period? Yeah. Now, these are actually really interesting because in most countries they exist and there is nothing in law. The companies say that there's something special about it in your contract, except contracts can't override country laws. And usually labor laws prevent you from, say, getting rid of somebody after a couple of weeks because you don't like the look of them. Yet companies will often make out as if this is exactly what they can do. But why do probationary periods exist in the first place? The probation period allows you to assess whether an employee is right for you. You can take the time to evaluate if your new employee is showing the same potential that you identified in them during the application process and the interview. Put simply, the hiring process was not sufficient to tell you if somebody was a good fit or not. In fact, in this quote, they make mention of an application and an interview, which is often all that hiring consists of. How do you assess somebody's technical capabilities, let alone whether they're a fit for the working environment with an interview? So, automatic, we don't have probationary periods. Instead, we have trials, where we take a prospective hire on as a paid contractor for a number of weeks. We give them projects to do during this time and carefully monitor their progress, including how they fit in with the team. We also ask specific questions during these initial interviews around remote working, and we carefully watch this during the trial. People can do the trial at the same time as maintaining a current job as you fit it into your own time. Before someone even gets to the trial stage, they will often have one or two technical exercises to do, often quite complex and demanding. Even if this is an office hire, you can do this with them performing this work at home and sending it in. But some people who do hiring don't like this. They could get help. They can look at answers. But isn't this what we all do in real life anyway? I went for an interview many years ago as a PHP developer. And after the great traditional face-to-face -face interview, I was led away to a room. Now, this was before smartphones were a thing. And all that was in the room was a Windows desktop PC and a test that I had to complete on it, 20 questions. And it's questions such as this. Now, who memorizes all the parameters of PHP? What everyone does is you look them up when you need to. I answered about two out of the 20 questions, and so I spent my time explaining at the end, via a long complaint, what was wrong with the test and how unrealistic it was. I didn't get the job. But I was right. That was an unrealistic test. It isn't how people work in reality. Even if this is an office hire, why not do the same trial method yourself? Unless doing the job requires you to be physically in an office, you can test the capabilities of a potential hire. If you're then allowing some staff to work from home, then you can add in checking to see if they're a good fit for this. The important thing is not to give them the answers to the actual question. So make them open-ended. For example, you could ask, what would your work, your week look like? Or have you, have you worked remotely before? What were the biggest benefits and challenges? These are questions that we ask at VIP. Now, as well as being very targeted on the, on the questions and general expectations, we are thorough. 
Now, so, for the VIP team, what percentage of support engineer applications do you think make it through to the trial stage? This is another one where you can all have a guess. Percentage of applications, that, this isn't even higher, this is through to the trial. 3%. It is 2.3%, very close. And less than 54% then make it through to being hired. Now, that doesn't mean we have a large number of resources to do this. A lot of the time, it's me. Instead, it's done remotely, and it's all prepared and documented. We use scripts for interviews and tools to manage applicants. So, ask open-ended questions about remote working. Trial people if you can, and don't have probation periods. Have a process that hires the right people. The thing is, nothing I've said today is revolutionary. Many of the practices and techniques shouldn't cost a business very much and are likely to lead to very happy staff. So, let's revisit that statement I made at the beginning. I hope what you've learned today is that remote working isn't something that many companies can just do. And yes, it does for many require some adjustments. Yet many of these changes, sorry, yet many of these are changes that any business can do, whether they're considering remote working or not, and, and will lead to benefits, whether that's a better awareness of what work is happening or simply a more content workforce. For the notes from this slide, along with source resources, please visit this link. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does that mean you have time to do your laundry, washing up, and stuff like that? Absolutely, yeah. I like how you think. Um, I've got a question. So yeah. The problem that I faced as a remote slash flexible worker at home. I don't know about you, but everyone assumes that because you work from home, you are free 24-7. Which means you have time to pick up the laundry, to walk their dog, to do their shopping, to take the car to the mechanic, whatever, or these things. What's your technique to have that boundary, have that barrier? When, when you, you say everyone, working. do you mean your family? Family, friends, family. That, that is quite difficult, and even I still struggle with that one. Um, when the um, children are off to school, it's, yeah, it's like, kind of, I, I am working. I, I am still working. It's so much easier when the house is empty during the day because no one's there, but once it's the school holidays, yeah, that can be quite difficult, and it is just a case of Not the reminders and iteration, I think, a lot, a lot of it, yeah. That, that is a difficult one, distraction. And again, distractions is one of those things that during our trial process, we do specifically ask about, and we do, um, you know, monitor as well. Even for me, I haven't perfected it, but if the phone rings, I don't answer it sometimes. Because they need to know that it doesn't mean that I'm available at, like, the drop of a hat. If the phone rings again by the same person, then okay, in an emergency, right, I need to pick up the phone. But you're right, if um, I'm lucky, empty house, my wife at work, so I've got a free phone. Okay. Yeah, right. Anybody have questions around this topic? A lot of um, traditional uh, organisations now are trying to fix their working. Uh, uh, sorry, flexi thing. But they retain a concept of um, four hours. Mm -hmm. Do you, does your organisation use that concept of four hours as a completely management by the outcome result? No. Um, there are some requirements for... It depends which part of automatic it is. So I can't speak for outside of VIP because I have, we have a lot less involvement with the wider automatic now. But um, yes, I mean, I'm flexible to do, but there is still a requirement for me to... I mean, there would probably be some conversation if I suddenly decided to start working US times. For example, you know, if I decide to start working in the evenings, I think there's a general expectation I'm going to be working a UK-ish time zone. 
where that flexibility comes in is the fact that it's not a nine to five. In fact, generally, I start at seven. I get up, have breakfast, and then I'm straight on it. But, and then I usually finish about five, which is like ten long hours, but that's taken into account that I'm probably spending, you know, two of those hours mowing the lawn and whatever else. But they know what kind of hours I will be around. But certainly in VIP, there's no kind of like set hours. But, you know, but certainly when people are... And this comes back to hiring as well, because if it was truly flexibly or whatever, you would hire somebody no matter where they are. But when we do hiring, we do look for specific time zones, because there is an expectation they will generally work around the times of that time zone. Do I have a question? Okay. Out of curiosity, who is a remote worker or flex worker? Quite a few. Quite a few. Um, because one thing that I picked up you were saying is about how there's an assumption that remote workers you start nine and finish at five on the dot and then you're out and that's it. My experience is that the rest of you is that I work for longer time where my wife, she pulls my chair out of the office and put me in front of the PlayStation. Literally. I'm quite lucky. Um, so there's always an assumption that people, they work less hours because you work from home, but in my experience, it's not. So uh, I, that's a myth I hear a lot as well. I'm working in a government organization in Glasgow, so I, I'm, I'm at a juncture where flexi time, you can take a week off, sorry, a day off a week, and all those things are saying. So I'm looking at both the things. I want to know from you how much of, I, I understand people are more productive when they're working as, per, as, as you have suggested, but how much of it is, you know, uh, driven with the management of the company saving money because Looking at government organization, I think they've reduced 40 hours of working week to 35 and they are now promoting remote working. And the reason for that is that they are reducing and cutting corners or infrastructure. So how much of truth is there? Because we tend to promote things the way we it suits us. So now they're saying that people are more productive. In our office also they're saying you can work from anywhere. Mm. But practically the job is not getting done because somebody is not reachable, somebody is not doing it, there is no communication. So when you're promoting remote working, I'm, I'm in agreement with your philosophy and the how, because this is a private organization, people are dedicated and your selection process is strictly vetted. Mm -hmm. And you're able to locate those, you know, spot that talent who is fitting mm -hmm. well. But how realistic it is, <laughs> that is that is a question. Uh, but I would certainly say if you're doing it for cost-cutting reasons, then you're probably very definitely doing it wrong then, because I would say that if you're doing it correctly, it, you won't be saving costs, because the, the money that you will save from you know, people remote working, you should be ploughing back into things like, as I mentioned, meetups, you know, office equipment, yes. um, and all the rest of it. it. This is not about saving money. This is uh, this is to provide uh, you know a lot more flexibility uh, for your workforce, and and in a lot of cases, you know, um, people a lot happier as well. You know, uh, just uh, out of uh, personal, very personal, very specific example. Like, I may not be in the UK because I'm an international person who finished my studies and I need to have a certain visa and my employer, who is a government organization, mm -hmm. they are not willing to spend £1,000 to get a license to sponsor me. So, so it, is, it is really about cutting corners and, mm -hmm. you know, even if you have some good employees, you don't, they don't want to retain. You don't even have coffee in the office, so you you are buying it every time. So yet. at some point there is a sentiment that let's reduce our fixed cost. Let's reduce like they've given us laptops and that's all. Yeah, you don't have PDF on it. You don't have a proprietary Microsoft Office on it. 
So they have a Citrix, which is a pooled office, and then you log on. So yes, there is there is an element of cost cutting. Yeah. 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 No, interesting. Uh, one more question. If anybody has a question. Mm-hmm. Um, what you were saying before about working over hours, I do that all the time. And I don't know if you have any advice on, like, I just don't know when to stop. Like, I just keep working and working and working. It's midnight, and I'm still in front of my laptop. I haven't had dinner, I haven't had a shower. Like, I'm just coding all day. Um... I'm just thinking what would happen if I did that, and I would probably get a um, very sharp Slack message from my lead because, you know, and this goes back to the very first bit about your managers needing to have a better idea of what you're doing, and it should be obvious. I mean, only the other week I was... I, I know the team was struggling, our US team was struggling, and so I was on one evening UK time trying to help them out, and I think she spotted me and sent me one of those messages to say, hey, it's 10 p.m. your time, get off. Um, so, you know, managers that have an awareness of what you're doing is really helpful there because it is really difficult for you personally because that is one of the other things and about remote working. You have all your equipment at home and it's just really tempting to finish something off and just go back to it. It doesn't happen when you work, walk away from the office and leave everything behind. You've got it there. And I often will, but... Again, this comes down to the flexibility of it. I can have really poor days. You go back to those, you know, three hours of work or whatever you get in. I, I still have those working from, from home. And I feel really guilty about it. And so I will get my laptop out early evening and do a bit more work because I've got the ability to do that. Um, but it's a really difficult one, really. Of, you know, and, and, and I think... Uh, a management awareness that you are doing that and getting them involved is really helpful for that. It's definitely an element of self-awareness about this. One thing I've learned the hard way that there's an assumption that if you do 12 hours of work, it's more productive than you do 6 hours of work. And I completely busted that in the past few months. Now, a few times a week, I take extended lunch break. Instead of one hour, I take two hours for lunch. And then I work less, hour, less hours on those days. I found out that I was more productive. I got more done in less time. Because you've got energy, you're fresh, you're feeling better, all these things. It took me time. Not easy. You have to be aware of it. But gradually, you get there. So I try to do that. I try to experiment. Think about it. what are you doing really if you're working 12 hours? Are you really working 12 hours? You might be doing a few things that are not needed. You can grab and cut it down. And then you can ask my wife to how you kick out of your office. That's really to me anyway. So maybe you need someone to do that for you as well. To kick you out. That might help. Um, go on then. The, the lady at the back here highlighted an underlying problem that uh, if the manager is identifying a particular task to be say of one hour, and if you try to speed on it, there's no way it can finish in one hour, I think four hours. Mm-hmm. But the manager is quantifying that as one hour. Mm-hmm. Uh, and probably that is the, sometimes the reason why you're overworked. Mm-hmm. You carry on doing your work. You all quantified that as a one hour work, but you, you know that it's, it takes lot longer. Um, sometimes it's hard to put it across. Yeah. Uh, and also, sometimes uh, I don't know how you can even quantify a work which is very, very creative. It's something you know, that you flash of idea, it can be done in five minutes, and sometimes it's five days. Yeah. Totally. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I didn't go into the specifics, because different jobs, different roles are going to require different ways of looking at them to see how that you can track what people are doing, how you measure their output. It's going to be different. I can only speak to the support role that I do. Um, and most of it is just some very open and honest discussion with your management. 
and and that has to be key to this having you know and the one thing I've noticed that, and, and this has got nothing to do with whether you're remote working in an office or whatever, but one of the key things I've seen since I've been working for Automatic is the very fact I'm treated so much more as an adult, having adult conversations with people about how to do stuff than, than I ever had um, at my previous employers. And so I, I think that's important to it. It's got to be very frank, open, honest conversations and, and getting down to that. Something I did have in my talk, and I actually took out just for time, whatever, was that not long after I joined the VIP team, my, my lead at the time sat down with me, not literally, because he was on the other side of the world, but and, and had a conversation with me um, to, and worked out a kind of like minimum work level for me. If you were having a really terrible week, how would we identify this? And we worked on it together. And this is a new concept for me, kind of like, what, you're not going to be, you're a manager, you're not just going to dictate to me what this is. We worked it all out. And now there's this, there's this measure in place now. If I drop below that, my manager would get into contact with me and say, hey, is everything okay? You, you, your work output just it seems to be very good this last week. I'm, I'm assuming that would still happen. I've never actually hit that, thankfully. Uh, but that's the whole idea, that it would, kind of be, it would definitely be a kind of like, there's something wrong here if this ever happens. Um, putting that in place was less important. What was the more, more important bit was that conversation and how it happened. On that note, I'll for David. Thank you, David. Thanks very much. Thank you.